Greetings esteemed viewers, and welcome to Tailingo, the channel dedicated to enhancing your English language proficiency through the art of storytelling. You'll learn English through story. Tailingo was created with the aim of making English learning both highly effective and enjoyable. If you're looking to reach the peak of English proficiency through entertaining stories and novels, don't forget to subscribe Tailingo and press bell icon. Iron Hans There was once upon a time a king who had a great forest near his palace, full of all kinds of wild animals. One day he sent out a huntsman to shoot him a roe, but he did not come back. Perhaps some accident has befallen him, said the king, and the next day he sent out two more huntsmen who were to search for him, but they too stayed away. Then on the third day he sent for all his huntsmen, and said scour the whole forest through, and do not give up until you have found all three. But of these also, none came home again, none were seen again. From that time forth, no one would any longer venture into the forest, and it lay there in deep stillness and solitude, and nothing was seen of it, but sometimes an eagle or a hawk flying over it. This lasted for many years, when an unknown huntsman announced himself to the king as seeking a situation, and offered to go into the dangerous forest. The king, however, would not give his consent, and said, It is not safe in there. I fear it would fare with you no better than with the others, and you would never come out again. The huntsman replied, Lord, I will venture it at my own risk, a fear I know nothing. The huntsman therefore betook himself with his dog to the forest. It was not long before the dog fell in with some game on the way, and wanted to pursue it. But hardly had the dog run two steps when it stood before a deep pool, could go no farther, and a naked arm stretched itself out of the water, seized it, and drew it under. When the huntsman saw that, he went back and fetched three men to come with buckets and bale out the water. When they could see to the bottom there lay a wild man whose body was brown like rusty iron, and whose hair hung over his face down to his knees. They bound him with cords, and led him away to the castle. There was great astonishment over the wild man. The king, however, had him put in an iron cage in his courtyard, and forbade the door to be opened on pain of death, and the queen herself was to take the key into her keeping. And from this time forth everyone could again go into the forest with safety. The king had a son of eight years, who was once playing in the courtyard, and while he was playing, his golden ball fell into the cage. The boy ran thither and said, Give me my ball out. Not till you have opened the door for me, answered the man. No, said the boy, I will not do that. The king has forbidden it, and ran away. The next day he again went and asked for his ball. The wild man said, Open my door, but the boy would not. On the third day the king had ridden out hunting, and the boy went once more and said, I cannot open the door even if I wished, for I have not the key. Then the wild man said, It lies under your mother's pillow, you can get it there. The boy, who wanted to have his ball back, cast all thought to the winds, and brought the key. The door opened with difficulty, and the boy pinched his fingers. When it was open the wild man stepped out, gave him the golden ball, and hurried away. The boy had become afraid. He called and cried after him, Oh, wild man, do not go away, or I shall be beaten. The wild man turned back, took him up, set him on his shoulder, and went with hasty steps into the forest. When the king came home, he observed the empty cage, and asked the queen how that had happened. She knew nothing about it, and sought the key, but it was gone. She called the boy, but no one answered. The king sent out people to seek for him in the fields, but they did not find him. Then he could easily guess what had happened, and much grief reigned in the royal court. When the wild man had once more reached the dark forest, he took the boy down from his shoulder, and said to him, You will never see your father and mother again, but I will keep you with me, for you have set me free, and I have compassion on you. If you do all I bid you, you shall fare well. Of treasure and gold have I enough, and more than any one in the world. He made a bed of moss for the boy on which he slept, and the next morning the man took him to a well, and said, Behold, the gold well is as bright and clear as crystal, you shall sit beside it, and take care that nothing falls into it, 
or it will be polluted. I will come every evening to see if you have obeyed my order. The boy placed himself by the brink of the well, and often saw a golden fish or a golden snake show itself therein, and took care that nothing fell in. As he was thus sitting, his finger hurt him so violently that he involuntarily put it in the water. He drew it quickly out again, but saw that it was quite gilded, and whatsoever pains he took to wash the gold off again, all was to no purpose. In the evening Iron Hans came back, looked at the boy, and said, What has happened to the well? Nothing, nothing, he answered, and held his finger behind his back, that the man might not see it. But he said, You have dipped your finger into the water, this time it may pass, but take care you do not again let anything go in. By daybreak the boy was already sitting by the well and watching it. His finger hurt him again and he passed it over his head, and then unhappily a hair fell down into the well. He took it quickly out, but it was already quite gilded. Iron Hans came, and already knew what had happened. You have let a hair fall into the well, said he. I will allow you to watch by it once more, but if this happens for the third time then the well is polluted and you can no longer remain with me. On the third day, the boy sat by the well, and did not stir his finger, however much it hurt him. But the time was long to him, and he looked at the reflection of his face on the surface of the water. And as he still bent down more and more while he was doing so, and trying to look straight into the eyes, his long hair fell down from his shoulders into the water. He raised himself up quickly, but the whole of the hair of his head was already golden and shone like the sun. You can imagine how terrified the poor boy was. He took his pocket handkerchief and tied it round his head in order that the man might not see it. When he came he already knew everything and said take the handkerchief off. Then the golden hair streamed forth and let the boy excuse himself as he might, it was of no use. You have not stood the trial and can stay here no longer. Go forth into the world, there you will learn what poverty is. But as you have not a bad heart, and as I mean well by you, there is one thing I will grant you. If you fall into any difficulty, come to the forest and cry, Iron Hans, and then I will come and help you. My power is great, greater than you think, and I have gold and silver in abundance. Then the king's son left the forest, and walked by beaten and unbeaten paths ever onwards until at length he reached a great city. There he looked for work, but could find none and he learned nothing by which he could help himself. At length he went to the palace, and asked if they would take him in. The people about court did not at all know what use they could make of him, but they liked him, and told him to stay. At length the cook took him into his service, and said he might carry wood and water, and rake the cinders together. Once when it so happened that no one else was at hand, the cook ordered him to carry the food to the royal table. But as he did not like to let his golden hair be seen, he kept his little cap on. Such a thing as that had never yet come under the king's notice, and he said, When you come to the royal table you must take your hat off. He answered, Ah, Lord, I cannot. I have a bad sore place on my head. Then the king had the cook called before him and scolded him, and asked how he could take such a boy as that into his service, and that he was to send him away at once. The cook, however, had pity on him, and exchanged him for the gardener's boy. And now the boy had to plant and water the garden, hoe and dig, and bear the wind and bad weather. Once in summer when he was working alone in the garden, the day was so warm he took his little cap off that the air might cool him. As the sun shone on his hair it glittered and flashed so that the rays fell into the bedroom of the king's daughter, and up she sprang to see what that could be. Then she saw the boy and cried to him, Boy, bring me a wreath of flowers. He put his cap on with all haste, and gathered wild field flowers and bound them together. When he was ascending the stairs with them, the gardener met him, and said, How can you take the king's daughter a garland of such common flowers? Go quickly, and get another, and seek out the prettiest and rarest. Oh, no, replied the boy, the wild ones have more scent, and will please her better. When he got into the room, the king's daughter said, Take your cap off, it is not seemly to keep it on in my presence. He again said, I may not, I have a sore head. She, however, caught at his cap and pulled it off, and then his golden hair rolled down on his shoulders, 
and it was splendid to behold. He wanted to run out, but she held him by the arm, and gave him a handful of ducats. With these he departed, but he cared nothing for the gold pieces. He took them to the gardener, and said, I present them to your children, they can play with them. The following day the king's daughter again called to him that he was to bring her a wreath of field flowers, and then he went in with it. She instantly snatched at his cap, and wanted to take it away from him, but he held it fast with both hands. She again gave him a handful of ducats, but he would not keep them, and gave them to the gardener for playthings for his children. On the third day things went just the same, she could not get his cap away from him, and he would not have her money. Not long afterwards, the country was overrun by war. The king gathered together his people, and did not know whether or not he could offer any opposition to the enemy, who was superior in strength and had a mighty army. Then said the gardener's boy, I am grown up, and will go to the wars also, only give me a horse. The others laughed, and said, Seek one for yourself when we are gone, we will leave one behind us in the stable for you. When they had gone forth, he went into the stable, and led the horse out. It was lame of one foot, and limped hobbledy jib, hobbledy jib. Nevertheless he mounted it, and rode away to the dark forest. When he came to the outskirts, he called Iron Hans three times so loudly that it echoed through the trees. Thereupon the wild man appeared immediately, and said, What do you desire? I want a strong steed, for I am going to the wars. That you shall have, and still more than you ask for. Then the wild man went back into the forest, and it was not long before a stable boy came out of it, who led a horse that snorted with its nostrils, and could hardly be restrained, and behind them followed a great troop of warriors entirely equipped in iron, and their swords flashed in the sun. The youth made over his three-legged horse to the stable boy, mounted the other, and rode at the head of the soldiers. When he got near the battlefield a great part of the king's men had already fallen, and little was wanting to make the rest give way. Then the youth galloped thither with his iron soldiers, broke like a hurricane over the enemy, and beat down all who opposed him. They began to flee, but the youth pursued, and never stopped, until there was not a single man left. Instead of returning to the king, however, he conducted his troop by byways back to the forest, and called forth Iron Hans. What do you desire? asked the wild man. Take back your horse and your troops, and give me my three-legged horse again. All that he asked was done, and soon he was riding on his three-legged horse. When the king returned to his palace, his daughter went to meet him, and wished him joy of his victory. I am not the one who carried away the victory, said he, but a strange knight who came to my assistance with his soldiers. The daughter wanted to hear who the strange knight was, but the king did not know, and said, He followed the enemy and I did not see him again. She inquired of the gardener where his boy was, but he smiled, and said, He has just come home on his three-legged horse, and the others have been mocking him, and crying. Here comes our hobbledy jib back again. They asked too, Under what hedge have you been lying sleeping all the time? So he said, I did the best of all, and it would have gone badly without me. And then he was still more ridiculed. The king said to his daughter, I will proclaim a great feast that shall last for three days, and you shall throw a golden apple. Perhaps the unknown man will show himself. When the feast was announced, the youth went out to the forest, and called Iron Hans. What do you desire? asked he. That I may catch the king's daughter's golden apple. It is as safe as if you had it already, said Iron Hans. You shall likewise have a suit of red armor for the occasion and ride on a spirited chestnut horse. When the day came, the youth galloped to the spot, took his place amongst the knights, and was recognized by no one. The king's daughter came forward, and threw a golden apple to the knights, but none of them caught it but he, only as soon as he had it he galloped away. On the second day Iron Hans equipped him as a white knight, and gave him a white horse. Again he was the only one who caught the apple, and he did not linger an instant, but galloped off with it. The king grew angry, and said, That is not allowed. He must appear before me and tell his name. He gave the order that if the knight who caught the apple 
should go away again they should pursue him, and if he would not come back willingly, they were to cut him down and stab him. On the third day, he received from Iron Hans a suit of black armor and a black horse, and again he caught the apple. But when he was riding off with it, the king's attendants pursued him, and one of them got so near him that he wounded the youth's leg with the point of his sword. The youth nevertheless escaped from them, but his horse leapt so violently that the helmet fell from the youth's head, and they could see that he had golden hair. They rode back and announced this to the king. The following day the king's daughter asked the gardener about his boy. He is at work in the garden. The queer creature has been at the festival too, and only came home yesterday evening. He has likewise shown my children three golden apples which he has won. The king had him summoned into his presence, and he came and again had his little cap on his head. But the king's daughter went up to him and took it off, and then his golden hair fell down over his shoulders, and he was so handsome that all were amazed. Are you the knight who came every day to the festival, always in different colors, and who caught the three golden apples? asked the king. Yes, answered he, and here the apples are, and he took them out of his pocket, and returned them to the king. If you desire further proof, you may see the wound which your people gave me when they followed me. But I am likewise the knight who helped you to your victory over your enemies. If you can perform such deeds as that, you are no gardener's boy. Tell me, who is your father? My father is a mighty king, and gold have I in plenty as great as I require. I will see, said the king, that I owe my thanks to you. Can I do anything to please you? Yes, answered he that indeed you can. Give me your daughter to wife. The maiden laughed, and said, He does not stand much on ceremony, but I have already seen by his golden hair that he was no gardener's boy, and then she went and kissed him. His father and mother came to the wedding, and were in great delight, for they had given up all hope of ever seeing their dear son again. And as they were sitting at the marriage feast, the music suddenly stopped, the doors opened, and a stately king came in with a great retinue. He went up to the youth, embraced him, and said, I am Iron Hans, and was by enchantment a wild man, but you have set me free. All the treasures which I possess shall be your property. The End Catskin There was once a king, whose queen had hair of the purest gold, and was so beautiful that her match was not to be met with on the whole face of the earth. But this beautiful queen fell ill, and when she felt that her end drew near she called the king to her and said, Promise me that you will never marry again, unless you meet with a wife who is as beautiful as I am, and who has golden hair like mine. Then when the king in his grief promised all she asked, she shut her eyes and died. But the king was not to be comforted, and for a long time never thought of taking another wife. At last, however, his wise men said this will not do, the king must marry again, that we may have a queen. So messengers were sent far and wide, to seek for a bride as beautiful as the late queen. But there was no princess in the world so beautiful, and if there had been, still there was not one to be found who had golden hair. So the messengers came home, and had had all their trouble for nothing. Now the king had a daughter, who was just as beautiful as her mother, and had the same golden hair. And when she was grown up, the king looked at her, and saw that she was just like this late queen. Then he said to his courtiers, May I not marry my daughter? She is the very image of my dead wife. Unless I have her, I shall not find any bride upon the whole earth, and you say there must be a queen. When the courtiers heard this they were shocked, and said, Heaven forbid that a father should marry his daughter. Out of so great a sin no good can come. And his daughter was also shocked but hoped the king would soon give up such thoughts. So she said to him, Before I marry anyone I must have three dresses. One must be of gold, like the sun, another must be of shining silver, like the moon, and a third must be dazzling as the stars. Besides this, I want a mantle of a thousand different kinds of fur put together, to which every beast in the kingdom must give a part of his skin. And thus she thought he would think of the matter no more. But the king made the most skillful workman in his kingdom weave the three dresses, one golden, like the sun, another silvery, like the moon, and a third sparkling, like the stars. And his hunters were told to hunt out all the beasts in his kingdom, 
and to take the finest fur out of their skins, and thus a mantle of a thousand furs was made. When all were ready, the king sent them to her, but she got up in the night when all were asleep, and took three of her trinkets, a golden ring, a golden necklace, and a golden brooch, and packed the three dresses, of the sun, the moon, and the stars, up in a nutshell, and wrapped herself up in the mantle made of all sorts of fur, and besmeared her face and hands with soot. Then she threw herself upon heaven for help in her need, and went away, and journeyed on the whole night till at last she came to a large wood. As she was very tired, she sat herself down in the hollow of a tree and soon fell asleep, and there she slept until it was midday. Now as the king to whom the wood belonged was hunting in it, his dogs came to the tree, and began to snuff about, and run round and round, and bark. Look sharp, said the king to the huntsman, and see what sort of game lies there. And the huntsman went up to the tree, and when they came back again said, In the hollow tree there lies a most wonderful beast, such as we never saw before. Its skin seems to be of a thousand kinds of fur, but there it lies fast asleep. See, said the king, if you can catch it alive, and we will take it with us. So the huntsman took it up, and the maiden awoke and was greatly frightened, and said, I am a poor child that has neither father nor mother left. Have pity on me and take me with you. Then they said, Yes, Miss Catskin, you will do for the kitchen, you can sweep up the ashes, and do things of that sort. So they put her into the coach, and took her home to the king's palace. Then they showed her a little corner under the staircase, where no light of day ever peeped in, and said, Catskin, you may lie and sleep there. And she was sent into the kitchen, and made to fetch wood and water, to blow the fire, pluck the poultry, pick the herbs, sift the ashes, and do all the dirty work. Thus Catskin lived for a long time very sorrowfully. Ah, pretty princess, thought she, what will now become of thee? But it happened one day that a feast was to be held in the king's castle, so she said to the cook, May I go up a little while and see what is going on? I will take care and stand behind the door. And the cook said, Yes, you may go, but be back again in half an hour's time, to rake out the ashes. Then she took her little lamp, and went into her cabin and took off the fur skin, and washed the soot from off her face and hands, so that her beauty shone forth like the sun from behind the clouds. She next opened her nutshell, and brought out of it the dress that shone like the sun, and so went to the feast. Everyone made way for her, for nobody knew her, and they thought she could be no less than a king's daughter. But the king came up to her, and held out his hand and danced with her, and he thought in his heart, I never saw any one half so beautiful. When the dance was at an end she curtsied, and when the king looked round for her, she was gone, no one knew whither. The guards that stood at the castle gate were called in, but they had seen no one. The truth was that she had run into her little cabin, pulled off her dress, blackened her face and hands, put on the fur-skin cloak, and was cat-skin again. When she went into the kitchen to her work, and began to rake the ashes, the cook said, Let that alone till the morning, and heat the king's soup. I should like to run up now and give a peep, but take care you don't let a hair fall into it, or you will run a chance of never eating again. As soon as the cook went away, Catskin heated the king's soup, and toasted a slice of bread first, as nicely as ever she could, and when it was ready, she went and looked in the cabin for her little golden ring, and put it into the dish in which the soup was. When the dance was over, the king ordered his soup to be brought in and it pleased him so well that he thought he had never tasted any so good before. At the bottom he saw a gold ring lying, and as he could not make out how it had got there, he ordered the cook to be sent for. The cook was frightened when he heard the order, and said to Catskin, You must have let a hare fall into the soup. If it be so, you will have a good beating. Then he went before the king, and he asked him who had cooked the soup. I did, answered the cook. But the king said, That is not true. It was better done than you could do it. Then he answered, To tell the truth I did not cook it, but Catskin did. Then let Catskin come up, said the king, and when she came he said to her, Who are you? I am a poor child, said she, that has lost both father and mother. How came you in my palace? asked he. 
I am good for nothing, said she, but to be scullion girl, and to have boots and shoes thrown at my head. But how did you get the ring that was in the soup? asked the king. Then she would not own that she knew anything about the ring, so the king sent her away again about her business. After a time there was another feast, and Catskin asked the cook to let her go up and see it as before. Yes, said he, but come again in half an hour, and cook the king the soup that he likes so much. Then she ran to her little cabin, washed herself quickly, and took her dress out which was silvery as the moon, and put it on, and when she went in, looking like a king's daughter, the king went up to her, and rejoiced at seeing her again, and when the dance began he danced with her. After the dance was at an end she managed to slip out, so slyly that the king did not see where she was gone, but she sprang into her little cabin, and made herself into catskin again, and went into the kitchen to cook the soup. Whilst the cook was above stairs, she got the golden necklace and dropped it into the soup. Then it was brought to the king, who ate it, and it pleased him as well as before. So he sent for the cook, who was again forced to tell him that Catskin had cooked it. Catskin was brought again before the king, but she still told him that she was only fit to have boots and shoes thrown at her head. But when the king had ordered a feast to be got ready for the third time, it happened just the same as before. You must be a witch, Catskin, said the cook, for you always put something into your soup, so that it pleases the king better than mine. However, he let her go up as before. Then she put on her dress which sparkled like the stars, and went into the ballroom in it, and the king danced with her again, and thought she had never looked so beautiful as she did then. So whilst he was dancing with her, he put a gold ring on her finger without her seeing it, and ordered that the dance should be kept up a long time. When it was at an end, he would have held her fast by the hand, but she slipped away, and sprang so quickly through the crowd that he lost sight of her, and she ran as fast as she could into her little cabin under the stairs. But this time she kept away too long, and stayed beyond the half hour, so she had not time to take off her fine dress, and threw her fur mantle over it, and in her haste did not blacken herself all over with soot, but left one of her fingers white. Then she ran into the kitchen, and cooked the king's soup, and as soon as the cook was gone, she put the golden brooch into the dish. When the king got to the bottom, he ordered Catskin to be called once more, and soon saw the white finger, and the ring that he had put on it whilst they were dancing, so he seized her hand, and kept fast hold of it, and when she wanted to loose herself and spring away, the fur cloak fell off a little on one side, and the starry dress sparkled underneath it. Then he got hold of the fur and tore it off, and her golden hair and beautiful form were seen, and she could no longer hide herself. So she washed the soot and ashes from her face, and showed herself to be the most beautiful princess upon the face of the earth. But the king said, You are my beloved bride, and we will never more be parted from each other. And the wedding feast was held, and a merry day it was, as ever was heard of or seen in that country, or indeed in any other. The End Snow White and Rose Red There was once a poor widow who lived in a lonely cottage. In front of the cottage was a garden wherein stood two rose trees, one of which bore white and the other red roses. She had two children who were like the two rose trees, and one was called Snow White, and the other Rose Red. They were as good and happy, as busy and cheerful as ever two children in the world were only Snow White was more quiet and gentle than Rose Red. Rose Red liked better to run about in the meadows and fields seeking flowers and catching butterflies. But Snow White sat at home with her mother and helped her with her housework, or read to her when there was nothing to do. The two children were so fond of one another that they always held each other by the hand when they went out together. And when Snow White said, We will not leave each other, Rose Red answered, never so long as we live, and their mother would add, what one has she must share with the other. They often ran about the forest alone and gathered red berries, and no beasts did them any harm, but came close to them trustfully. The little hare would eat a cabbage leaf out of their hands, the roe grazed by their side, the stag leapt merrily by them, and the birds sat still upon the boughs, and sang whatever they knew. No mishap overtook them, if they had stayed too late in the forest, and night came on, 
They laid themselves down near one another upon the moss, and slept until morning came, and their mother knew this and did not worry on their account. Once when they had spent the night in the wood and the dawn had roused them, they saw a beautiful child in a shining white dress sitting near their bed. He got up and looked quite kindly at them, but said nothing and went into the forest. And when they looked round they found that they had been sleeping quite close to a precipice, and would certainly have fallen into it in the darkness if they had gone only a few paces further. And their mother told them that it must have been the angel who watches over good children. Snow White and Rose Red kept their mother's little cottage so neat that it was a pleasure to look inside it. In the summer Rose Red took care of the house, and every morning laid a wreath of flowers by her mother's bed before she awoke, in which was a rose from each tree. In the winter Snow White lit the fire and hung the kettle on the hob. The kettle was of brass and shone like gold, so brightly was it polished. In the evening, when the snowflakes fell, the mother said, Go, Snow White, and bolt the door, and then they sat round the hearth, and the mother took her spectacles and read aloud out of a large book, and the two girls listened as they sat and spun. And close by them lay a lamb upon the floor, and behind them upon a perch sat a white dove with its head hidden beneath its wings. One evening, as they were thus sitting comfortably together, someone knocked at the door as if he wished to be let in. The mother said, Quick, Rose Red, open the door. It must be a traveler who is seeking shelter. Rose Red went and pushed back the bolt, thinking that it was a poor man, but it was not. It was a bear that stretched his broad, black head within the door. Rose Red screamed and sprang back. The lamb bleated, the dove fluttered, and Snow White hid herself behind her mother's bed. But the bear began to speak and said, Do not be afraid. I will do you no harm. I am half frozen and only want to warm myself a little beside you. Poor bear, said the mother, lie down by the fire. Only take care that you do not burn your coat. Then she cried, Snow White, Rose Red, come out. The bear will do you no harm. He means well. So they both came out, and by and by the lamb and dove came nearer, and were not afraid of him. The bear said, Here, children, knock the snow out of my coat a little. So they brought the broom and swept the bear's hide clean and he stretched himself by the fire and growled contentedly and comfortably. It was not long before they grew quite at home, and played tricks with their clumsy guest. They tugged his hair with their hands, put their feet upon his back and rolled him about, or they took a hazel switch and beat him, and when he growled they laughed. But the bear took it all in good part. Only when they were too rough he called out, Leave me alive, children. Snow White Rose Red Will you beat your wooer dead? When it was bedtime, and the others went to bed, the mother said to the bear, You can lie there by the hearth, and then you will be safe from the cold and the bad weather. As soon as day dawned the two children let him out, and he trotted across the snow into the forest. Henceforth the bear came every evening at the same time, laid himself down by the hearth, and let the children amuse themselves with him as much as they liked and they got so used to him that the doors were never fastened until their black friend had arrived. When spring had come and all outside was green, the bear said one morning to Snow White, Now I must go away, and cannot come back for the whole summer. Where are you going then, dear bear? asked Snow White. I must go into the forest and guard my treasures from the wicked dwarfs. In the winter, when the earth is frozen hard, they are obliged to stay below and cannot work their way through. But now, when the sun has thawed and warmed the earth, they break through it, and come out to pry and steal, and what once gets into their hands, and in their caves, does not easily see daylight again. Snow White was quite sorry at his departure, and as she unbolted the door for him, and the bear was hurrying out, he caught against the bolt, and a piece of his hairy coat was torn off, and it seemed to Snow White as if she had seen gold shining through it, but she was not sure about it. The bear ran away quickly, and was soon out of sight behind the trees. A short time afterwards the mother sent her children into the forest to get firewood. There they found a big tree which lay felled on the ground, and close by the trunk something was jumping backwards and forwards in the grass, but they could not make out what it was. When they came nearer they saw a dwarf with an old withered face and a snow-white beard a yard long. The end of the beard was caught in a crevice of the tree, 
and the little fellow was jumping about like a dog tied to a rope, and did not know what to do. He glared at the girls with his fiery red eyes and cried, Why do you stand there? Can you not come here and help me? What are you up to, little man? asked Rose Red. You stupid, prying goose, answered the dwarf. I was going to split the tree to get a little wood for cooking. The little bit of food that we people get is immediately burned up with heavy logs. We do not swallow so much as you coarse, greedy folk. I had just driven the wedge safely in, and everything was going as I wished. But the cursed wedge was too smooth and suddenly sprang out, and the tree closed so quickly that I could not pull out my beautiful white beard. So now it is tight and I cannot get away, and the silly, sleek, milk-faced things laugh. Ugh! How odious you are! The children tried very hard, but they could not pull the beard out. It was caught too fast. I will run and fetch someone, said Rose Red. You senseless goose, snarled the dwarf. Why should you fetch someone? You are already too, too many for me. Can you not think of something better? Don't be impatient, said Snow White. I will help you. And she pulled her scissors out of her pocket and cut off the end of the beard. As soon as the dwarf felt himself free, he laid hold of a bag which lay amongst the roots of the tree, and which was full of gold, and lifted it up, grumbling to himself, uncouth people, to cut off a piece of my fine beard. Bad luck to you, and then he swung the bag upon his back, and went off without even once looking at the children. Some time afterwards Snow White and Rose Red went to catch a dish of fish. As they came near the brook they saw something like a large grasshopper jumping towards the water, as if it were going to leap in. They ran to it, and found it was the dwarf. Where are you going? said Rose Red. You surely don't want to go into the water. I am not such a fool, cried the dwarf. Don't you see that the accursed fish wants to pull me in? The little man had been sitting there fishing, and unluckily the wind had tangled up his beard with the fishing line. A moment later a big fish made a bite and the feeble creature had not strength to pull it out. The fish kept the upper hand and pulled the dwarf towards him. He held on to all the reeds and rushes, but it was of little good, for he was forced to follow the movements of the fish, and was in urgent danger of being dragged into the water. The girls came just in time. They held him fast and tried to free his beard from the line, but all in vain, beard and line were entangled fast together. There was nothing to do but to bring out the scissors and cut the beard, whereby a small part of it was lost. When the dwarf saw that he screamed out, Is that civil, you toadstool, to disfigure a man's face? Was it not enough to clip off the end of my beard? Now you have cut off the best part of it. I cannot let myself be seen by my people. I wish you had been made to run the saws off your shoes. Then he took out a sack of pearls which lay in the rushes and without another word he dragged it away and disappeared behind a stone. It happened that soon afterwards the mother sent the two children to the town to buy needles and thread, and laces and ribbons. The road led them across a heath upon which huge pieces of rock lay strewn about. There they noticed a large bird hovering in the air, flying slowly round and round above them. It sank lower and lower, and at last settled near a rock not far away. Immediately they heard a loud, piteous cry. They ran up and saw with horror that the eagle had seized their old acquaintance the dwarf, and was going to carry him off. The children, full of pity, at once took tight hold of the little man, and pulled against the eagle so long that at last he let his booty go. As soon as the dwarf had recovered from his first fright he cried with his shrill voice, Could you not have done it more carefully? You dragged at my brown coat so that it is all torn and full of holes, you clumsy creatures. Then he took up a sack full of precious stones, and slipped away again under the rock into his hole. The girls, who by this time were used to his ingratitude, went on their way and did their business in town. As they crossed the heath again on their way home, they surprised the dwarf, who had emptied out his bag of precious stones in a clean spot, and had not thought that anyone would come there so late. The evening sun shone upon the brilliant stones, they glittered and sparkled with all colors so beautifully that the children stood still and stared at them. Why do you stand gaping there? cried the dwarf, and his ashen gray face became copper red with rage. He was still cursing when a loud growling was heard, 
and a black bear came trotting towards them out of the forest. The dwarf sprang up in a fright, but he could not reach his cave, for the bear was already close. Then in the dread of his heart he cried, Dear Mr. Bear, spare me. I will give you all my treasures. Look, the beautiful jewels lying there. Grant me my life. What do you want with such a slender little fellow as I? You would not feel me between your teeth. Come, take these two wicked girls. They are tender morsels for you, fat as young quails. For mercy's sake eat them. The bear took no heed of his words, but gave the wicked creature a single blow with his paw, and he did not move again. The girls had run away, but the bear called to them, Snow White and Rose Red, do not be afraid. Wait, I will come with you. Then they recognized his voice and waited, and when he came up to them suddenly his bearskin fell off, and he stood there a handsome man, clothed all in gold. I am a king's son, he said, and I was bewitched by that wicked dwarf, who had stolen my treasures. I have had to run about the forest as a savage bear until I was freed by his death. Now he has got his well-deserved punishment. Snow White was married to him, and Rose Red to his brother, and they divided between them the great treasure which the dwarf had gathered together in his cave. The old mother lived peacefully and happily with her children for many years. She took the two rose trees with her, and they stood before her window, and every year bore the most beautiful roses, white and red. The End And there you have it, folks. We've reached the end of this incredible story together, but the adventure doesn't stop here. We have a variety of story videos like this one available for your enjoyment. To watch more, just click here. If you've enjoyed this story and want more mind-blowing stories, be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on our next epic upload. Trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next.